Welcome everyone to the C-Suite Sales and Marketing Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. Today, we have a Change Your Perspective podcast with Sebastian Postrito. And Sebastian, you've been a four-time B2B tech CMO. Within that role, you've worked extensively with sales organizations, training sales organizations. You've been in business development. You owned your own agency that you built to 10 million. You were the president, you were the chief sales officer, you were the sales channel, the pitch guy. And what we're going to be talking a lot about today is how to get salespeople out from behind the product and why we even want to do that, right? Because obviously the product, the tech, services, that's what we're selling. But why this change of perspective? Why we need to get out from behind the product and how do we do that? But if you wouldn't mind just before we get into the conversation, maybe expanding a little bit on your background and what you're doing right now. Sure. Thanks a lot, Steve, for having me. So I was originally born in Italy. I came to the U.S. at the age of 12. I started my career working for Ford Motor Company. I went to school, got an undergraduate in electrical engineering. And while I was at Ford, I started to understand the value that the more you were connected to revenue, the more valuable you were to an organization. So there is where I went back to school and got a business degree. Once I got my business degree, I started my career where I am today, which is really around technology and marketing in a B2B world. I was fortunate enough to work with a number of different technology companies where I learned my skill set, where I perfected sort of my playbook in those organizations. And I worked for companies that went from 8 million to 350 million in a four or five year window and really learned a lot about how to grow those organizations. What does it take from a sales standpoint? What does a sales organization look like? How do you effectively sell? How do you have a higher closure rate? And how do you grow the business? So I've been fortunate enough in my career to really do all those kinds of things. And as you mentioned earlier, I also ran my own agency where I was the pitch guy. I was out with the clients and I was able to significantly grow that organization by learning exactly how to be a better salesperson. And hopefully that's what we're here to talk about. I love that you've got perspectives from every different angle, right? You've done the job as a salesperson. You've actually been inside of B2B organizations. You've been in a service organization inside of the agency serving your B2B clients. So you've seen it from every side and you've run into every challenge and you and I have been in this industry. We've been doing it for a long time. What I'd love to ask you, the very first question here is, what exactly is the change in perspective that you would like to have us know and understand? I think it's important to understand that when you're selling, it's really about you building trust with that prospect. And the way you're going to build that trust is to understand what that individual is trying to sell. So stop trying to sell your product. Stop trying to demonstrate your product. But fundamentally, get into a mode where you're asking a lot of discovery questions, a lot of information where you can then use that information from that individual and cater or solution or position back out how you can add value or solve that problem. So really, it's more about Don't try to sell so hard, but rather build a rapport, ask pointed questions, build a friendship, build trust. Selling is really not about selling what you're trying to sell. Selling is about selling yourself to the individual that you're talking to. So it's really about credibility. And the way you build credibility is that you're trustworthy. And the way you become trustworthy is by understanding and focusing on the person that you're talking to and asking the right questions. I call it the why questions. I love to really go in and and say to individuals, not I'm here to try to sell you something. I'm here to understand what you're trying to sell. So I ask these why questions and I ask things like, why are you doing this? Why are you making a change? Why have you done it the way you've done it currently? And so when you start to put that why word in front of those questions, then you put that on the prospect to start to justify, we've done it this way because, and you'll hear things like, because that's how we've always done it, or that's the way we're structured. But then you also say, why are you wanting to change? And again, you start to hear those reasons, the business reasons, which is what you want to hone in on and ask them. And out of that why question is going to be things like, 
I want to change it because it's taking us too long. It touches four or five people within our organization. It takes us a whole half a day to resolve these issues. But we're not efficient. It costs us a lot of resources. Our clients want us to be much more proactive than reactive. We have to do a lot of paper filing. So now you start to understand that it's not about the product that you're trying to sell. It's about all these business issues that they're trying to tap. And so as a salesperson, you want to ask those questions first. You want to listen very carefully to the answers to those why questions. And then you want to reframe them. You want to go back and say, Steve, if I heard you correctly, the challenge you're having today is it takes you a half a day to do this. You got John, Mary, and Sally. You'd like to cut that in half. The clients want you to be more proactive. It's costing you a lot of money to solve these issues. It's too manual of a process. Did I hear you correctly? And that individual is going to say, yes, except you missed this and this. Now you start to have a conversation. You're not selling. It's not a push and a pull sort of dynamic. You're having a real conversation. And the guy in his head, the person that you're talking to, is like goes, oh, my God, he's listening to me. Oh, my God, he understands what the challenge I have to solve with. And so now what you do is by verbalizing what you heard, getting him to acknowledge that what you said to him is exactly the problem. Then he adds a little more color to it. What you're actually doing together by not realizing is you are solutioning the answer to his problem. Now, if your solution, if your product, if your service is part of that, that's fantastic. But the number one thing you want to do is reflect back that you heard him, get him to verify that's really what he's trying to solve. And now together say, now, if we can reduce that by two hours, if we can reduce that by a third of the staff, if we could provide you reports, and now you start to introduce sort of the value in your solution, then he says, yes. But really what he's saying in his head is, he understands me. And by you coming in and providing that level of a dialogue, he's saying is that this guy is not trying to sell me. This guy fundamentally is trying to understand what I'm trying to solve. And he's building rapport. I trust this guy. And it's a completely different way of selling. Here's what I'm taking out of this, which I absolutely love, is the more that we can get our prospects to talk and the more that we can listen, the better. Yeah. So asking these questions up front, we all have in the sales enablement materials in the library, we have all kinds of presentations and slides and one sheeters, graphs and data that we can pull out. But as soon as we do that, we're leading the conversation. We're structuring the conversation and we're not listening. And most of those slides are geared to what we want to sell. Where what you're saying is we need to understand the bigger dynamic, the bigger challenge, and the bigger solution that needs to be put into place. Nine times out of 10, we're going to be a big part of that solution. Yep. But if we're not, then that's part of the honesty, right? That's part of the trust factor that you're building up. In fact, one of our previous conversations, you talked about sometimes the result was, I'm not sure we can help you, but here's maybe some people that can, right? That's the kind of trust. That's the kind of honesty that builds that relationship. And the last thing before I ask this question is, we all know nobody wants to be sold to. They want to be advised. So our role is to be a trusted advisor. Right. That's not our conversation or our language, right? That's Gardner, that's Forrester, that's everybody, right? So being a trusted advisor is actually having a focus on them and their bigger challenges and the solutions that can be put together. How we fit in comes after that. That's a very hard thing. And I will tell you, when you tell someone, I may not be able to help you, but you go and solution together the challenge that he has, they're going to come back and want you. So they'll say, okay, you may not have what I need, but I'm going to lean on you to make the recommendations. And so all of a sudden the conversation changes. It's like you're trying to walk away and they don't want you to walk away because they fundamentally have been validated by you. They've heard that you've heard them. And so it's like, okay, this guy understands me. This guy hears me. I trust him. So even if he comes in and uses that magic word, like I may not be able to help you, but let me understand what you're trying to do and make some recommendations based on my industry experience and based on working with other organizations, similar to you or had similar challenges, here's how we were able to address those things. Now, all of a sudden, that's where the credibility comes in. 
all of a sudden you start to hear, if you want to walk away, they don't want you to walk away. That's a good signal because fundamentally what, what you've done at that point is you've built a trust. And you had talked about that, how, and I just loved how you put it, that it dis disarms them, right? Yeah. Because a typical sales conversation has a shield up in the middle of it between you and them, right? They're guarded, regardless about what they're going to say. They want to try to draw certain things out of you, but they don't want to reveal too much. It's that dance, right? And when you say something like, I'm not sure that we have the right solution for you, but I think I know some people that can... I could point you in the right direction. All of a sudden, that shield goes away. Oh, I'm not being sold to. Yeah. I'm being supported. I'm being advised. Yep. By somebody who's looking out after my interest because they're clearly not putting their interest first. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. You talk about how the prospect, you need to convince them that they do need you. That's part of it. But talk to us about some techniques that you use that build up that, hey, I need these guys. I need to have this conversation. I need to be potentially working with them. And it really goes down to that open dialogue, asking the right questions, independent of the solution, independent of the product. You say, what is it that you're trying to do? What's the challenge you're trying to do? What's it costing you if you don't make these changes? How do you see the organization today, what are some of these changes that you want to do? And literally going back and forth, even if it's just a piece of paper, or even if you're in a conference room with them presenting, go to the whiteboard and start to put together, get up a marker and say, okay, if I understand, this is what we're trying to solve together, right? And these are some of the hurdles that you're trying to do. And he'll step out, she'll step off of the conference room table, she'll grab the pen from your hand and say, yes, but also this and this. And literally you're starting to see this dynamic, this sort of customer salesperson wants to take a million dollars out of my budget. I'm not sure about it. You started to see this physical dynamic that happens just between the two of you to be able to do those kinds of things. And again, it's more about really listening to what's going on and how you can make those suggestions. Recommend. And it could be things like, I have a friend I'll connect you with. I have an organization that I connect you with. There's a conference that I typically go to that I think you should attend. It's ordered all of these resources that you start to pull into place. Hey, there's your counterpart at another organization. I'd love to connect the two of you together. But when you do that, which is like a use case or a case study and things that are more traditional, you're doing it in a dialogue. You're not handing them a document. You're not saying, read this case study and learn about how we've been able to stop. You're starting to build relationships. You become facilitator, connecting people in the industry, if they don't know each other, to leverage each other knowledge. And again, you're starting to build this. It's okay. I trust this guy. I'm starting to understand that he's connected, that he's done this before, that he knows other people in the industry who've had similar issues. I can learn from him, if nothing else out of this conversation. That idea of being that resource and connecting people. We all know the power of our networks, right? Yeah. And as a salesperson, you should have a pretty vast network, right? You've yeah. talked to a lot of people. That connection, those connection points, they can actually be between two prospects too. Yeah. It could be another reason why you're reaching out to prospect A to connect them to prospect B, right? And there's value in both of them and you brought that together we're looking at salespeople, especially in an ABM sales process, that's going to take months and months, a year, maybe even more. We can't just sell. We have to be doing those value-added things, yep. connecting, sharing, right? Yeah. And connecting goes a long way. The internet or LinkedIn calls them coins, currency, right? Social currency. And it's essentially what it is, building relationships, extending those relationships to other people, bringing people into your fold creates a trust factor. And at the end of the day, if you do that successfully, maybe you don't ultimately sell your solution to this individual, but this individual you didn't sell to successfully will be the one that will go to someone, another prospect mm -hmm. that you didn't even know existed. And that person will call you out of the blue and say, I was talking to Steve. He said that you're a trusted guy. You're well connected in the industry. You were trying to work out a solution. It didn't work out for him, but he highly recommends that I connect with you 
and trying to solve my problem. And so all of these things start to happen for you. We're all told you really need to understand your prospects, like at a very deep level. We've heard that and we've heard that and we've heard that. So we hear it again. What is your advice around really understanding your prospects? And how do you get to that understanding? And how is your thoughts on that are different than just what we've always heard? To me, it's forget what you're trying to do from a product or solution standpoint. Talk to that individual as if he was your best friend, if he was a collier, and fundamentally sit down across the table with him and have these very broad conversations. What are you trying to do? How can I help you? What is the challenge? How do you solve? What are you trying to solve? Have these very broad conversations and allow them to explain to you what exactly they're trying to do. Because fundamentally, it could be that what they're trying to do has really nothing to do with what you're offering. But it's this conversation that you want to have, right? So take your salesman hat off, if you will, right? Don't be pushy. Don't be, let me try to get your proposal next week. Just slow down, listen to the individual, hear him out, hear him what he's trying to do or her, try to figure out how long he's been doing that for? What is the change that he wants to do? Why does he want to make that change? When can he make that change? What's the cost associated for not changing? It's that level of conversation without bringing anything up, just a one-to-one -one business challenges. And all of a sudden, you start to hear the value that you could potentially bring. So it's just being a colleague. It's just being someone that's trying to hear them, but reflect it back right? Reflect the fact that the psychology tells you the greatest hunger we have is to be validated, to be understood. So if you hear them, say to them, this is what I heard. Is, is this really what you're trying to solve? And this is what it's costing you. Is this really what it's costing you, right? And what ends up happening, even if you're wrong, he's going to hear up say, oh my God, he's listening to me. And he's got one part that's wrong. Let me correct them. Say no, but also do this. And you go, okay, so now we have the full picture. It's that level of validation and understood that creates this relationship. And at the end of the day, why you want a relationship? Because people buy from people they trust. So it's nothing to do with your solution. They already have an idea. They went to your website. They went to your competitor's website. They downloaded a couple of collateral. The reason you're having the conversation in the first place is because they fundamentally believe that you have something there that they need. Now it's about, oh, I trust this individual. Do I trust that he can solve my problem? Does he understand me? Does he validate me? Can I pick up the phone at midnight when all hell breaks loose and his cell phone will ring and he'll pick up? Do I have that level of trust in this dialogue that I'm having with him? Hey, guess what? Those that you trust in, you're going to trust that they're going to build the right products too. Versus people you don't know, you don't trust. All of a sudden you build a trust. There's a halo that happens. because. We've talked a lot about step out from behind the product, right? Get to know. But this is all leading to the point where you're going to get to be very product focused, right? Because you're saying you are solutioning together and your product is a part of that solution. Tell us, though, about how the dynamic really of them asking for the proposal happens versus you having to push and, and try to make that step happen. So I think what happens is as you start to build this rapport, as you start to have this conversation, as you have this discovery, whether it's on the phone or whether it's face-to-face, -face, and you're collecting all of this information, you then absorb it all and you say, I think I got it. Now I'm going to be able to go back, think about this, and be able to come up with a solution. But I might not be able to help you. Use those terms in your conversation. I may not be able to help you, but I could certainly recommend something. And they're going to come back and say, Definitely get me a proposal. And if you can't solve the whole problem, I'm open. I trust you to make the recommendation that works best for me. So now it's not, hey, I'm going to write your proposal and send it to you. And I'll follow up on Wednesday to see what you think. They're asking you to put together a proposal, whether it includes you or not. But they just identified you in that conversation as the leader in solving his problem. And so now all of a sudden you're like, I may not be able to help you. And in his mind, he's going to verbalize it to you to say, no, you can. You might not be able to directly maybe help me with the solution that you have doesn't exactly solve what I got, 
but you got enough knowledge. You got my trust. You validated with me that you understand who I am, that I'm trusting you to come up with that solution, whatever it may be. So he's not going after somebody else. He's not saying, send me one. We have three proposals. We're going to make a decision in two weeks. He's fundamentally turned all that off and said, whatever you say, I'm going to follow. Two things. One is that guy or that woman is one member of a ever-growing buyer group or buyer committee internally yeah. that all have influence ultimately on it. So tell us a little bit about how does all this that we've been talking about, how does that impact the greater buying committee? So what happens is once you get past this process and you've got a solution together, now that individual will probably be your coach, but you'll have to have that conversation. You'll have to say, you know, who's going to make ultimate decision? Is it going to be you alone? Is it going to be a, a committee? And he's going to come back. If you've done the part so far correctly and build a report, he's going to be the champion. He's going to say, yes, we're going to have to go through procurement or we're going to have to go through the business unit to make those decisions. But since I'm on the inside and I have need to absorb the solution and support the solution, and I know the dynamics are going on internally, I'm going to help you to create the solution in a way that will pass that. So now all of a sudden, he becomes your champion. He becomes the guy that's going to guide you through the organization to be able to do that. And what he's going to do is not only make sure that the verbiage that the other guys want to hear in the committee, but he's going to be the influencer. He's going to be, listen, guys, I trust the solution. I trust the person. I've had a good conversation. I want to go with it. And so he's going to be able to do that. But that's only because you've done the first phase, which is you build a foundation with these individuals. This individual has a high trust level high confidence has been validated for you. So he will be able to say, yes, it's just me or there's a committee, the complex selling people always talk about for years, but literally this is a team internally and an individual can influence that group and an individual already knows the dynamics. So either they can influence the decision to go with you or they can coach you in making sure that the proposal speaks to all those different constituents. Fantastic. This is all about when you're already in the conversation, right? But we know that the trend is not in our favor as a salesperson, right? The self-service B2B buyer journey, where before they ever want to talk to us inside of an organization, they're well down the path, down to the point where they're short lists, there's specifics. And so all these building trust conversations and solutioning and everything need to happen earlier. How do we get into those conversations? How do we counteract this B2B self-buyer? How do you get into the conversations, right? Because we've been having the conversation here about what to do inside the conversation, right? Yeah. But it's getting into the conversation can be one, some of the biggest part of the problem. You have to be visible. People have to be top of mind. Whenever we're looking for a solution or a problem, there's usually one or two names top of mind. Why? Because we tend to see them very visible in the industry. We may see them on social media. We may see them at a conference. We may see them speaking. We may see people receiving their emails. We may see that they're part of a LinkedIn group. We may see that they're connected to somebody else in the organization. The first phase is to really identify what I call the water holes. Where are your prospects going? How are they connected? And so it could be organizations that we're all members of, nonprofits that are providing accreditation or they're providing education or they're providing conferences. Align yourself with those individuals. Make sure you're part of those partnerships. Make sure you attend those conferences. Do very strategic outreach, things like joint webinars. So there might be an organization that runs the entire industry or has an influence in the entire, whether it's a continued education organization or an accreditation, work with them, do a couple webinars. When you do the webinars together with them, what you do is they've already had the credibility. You're now aligning yourself with them and do a couple of these. And what ends up happening is your industry starts to say, wow, look at these guys. They're everywhere. They're connected with a bunch of industry leaders. I've seen them at the conference. They're speaking at the conference. They're doing webinar with these organizations. They're doing these sessions with them. I need to learn more about them. 
And then there's always the more strategic marketing programs, whether you do the digital advertising on social media, whether you target a particular group, whether you do an educational type session, whether you do blogs to be able to get that message out. But you have to identify the water holes. You have to identify this industry that you're part of. And now you want to get in front of the purchasers and you want to be part of that conversation. You have to go to those places, plant yourself there, be consistent and provide content, provide resource, provide help. And a lot of times it's somebody may be posting something, a chat or a LinkedIn, chime in and say, don't sell, say, hey, you should talk to Charlie. Let me talk, let me connect you with Charlie. Charlie had this issue six months ago. Charlie is your customer. You don't say he's your customer, but Char Charlie is going to be able to be a good reference or a good influencer type thing. Hey, I'm going to a conference next month. There's a session where it's going to talk about these things. You should probably attend if you're not, so you can have a much broader understanding of these challenges. And now they're going to these sessions, right? You're not selling to them. They're going to these sessions. They're looking around. They're saying there's a lot of people in this room, similar names, similar organization I'm aware of. They're talking about an operational issue that I have a challenge with. Looks like they figured it out. I haven't figured it out. I'm going to go. I'm going to take some notes and be able to do that. Now, all of a sudden, you're top of mind. They're going back to the organization. They get together with these five individuals, let's say, that are trying to solve this problem. You can chime in and say, hey, I, there's this guy on LinkedIn. Hey, this is an organization. Hey, they were at a conference. I just attended our regular accreditation webinar last month. They were there. They were talking about these types of issues. And so that's how you show up at the water holes, elevate yourself, be part of the conversation. And again, you're going to be part of the conversation because you're going to communicate in those platforms that you're part of the industry, you're trusted because look who's next to me, look who I'm doing the webinar with. It's somebody that you already are doing business with and I'm providing value. I'm talking about the things that you're trying to, that you're challenged with and I want to be able to help. If there was one takeaway that you wanted to make sure that folks had from this episode, what would that be? I think that the main point is build trust. Go out not thinking you want to sell someone. Go out thinking that you want to build a relationship with someone. And the way, the best way to do a relationship with someone is by helping them, by sticking your hand up whenever you see something, whenever you hear something, and say, here's how I can help. And keep it at a business level. Keep it at an individual level. Don't try to say, I have a solution that I can sell you that can solve that problem. Keep it as I'm in the industry. I've been helping a bunch of other organizations similar to you. I've heard these issues before. Let me connect you, not to me and not to somebody else in my organization who's going to sell you a solution. Let me connect you to your counterpart in another organization. And the two of you should connect. He's going to tell you how he solved this problem. And of course, that individual is your customer or somebody that can speak very highly. Of. So it's really about being where these individuals are. Be proactive, do the webinars, do the shows, be active on LinkedIn, but don't sell. Listen very carefully, reflect back and provide recommendation, provide an advice, provide a connection, provide a sort of a, a next step. And when you do that, when you say, let me connect you with Steve and him and have a conversation, then you follow up and do an email and say, Steve, I want you to introduce you to Sebastian. Sebastian's got a challenge, very similar to what you were trying to solve over a year ago. I really appreciate the two of you get to connect it. I'll leave it to you to connect. A week later, two weeks later, when that happens, he's going to come back to you and he's going to say, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot from Steve. He's very informative. We got, to, got together. In fact, we're going to go to the show next month and we're going to talk with each other. And then the next thing you know is the email is going to follow. And a phone call is going to follow and say, I went to the show. I talked to Steve. Not only did he solve the problem, but he said he solved it with you and some of your solution. Do you have time to come in next week after the show and present to my team? That's literally how it happened. I love it. I love it. That is a direct hit in terms of how do we get out from behind selling the product? Everything that you just said in that takeaway, nothing was about here's how you're leading to the product. It's yep. about networking and building that trust and finding out you know, their challenges, solutioning with, I know that there's going to be people that have questions after this podcast. 
Would it be appropriate that we provided a link to you on LinkedIn? So if people have questions. Absolutely. I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. I think that selling is a great way to connect with people. I think if you just get out of the mindset that you're trying to convince someone to give you money, but rather get in a mindset that you have some knowledge, you have some level of experience, some level of industry connections, and that the more you want to leverage that, the more you want to provide that to people with no strings attached, the more they're drawn to you, the more they come to you first. And even what they'll end up doing later on, like top of mind, though, they might say, I don't know what solution is out there to do that, but I know I'm going to call Sebastian. I'm going to call Sebastian because he, if he doesn't know, he's going to tell me where to go to know. And all of a sudden, now you have this relationship, right? You're now the go-to. I love it. So many words of wisdom here. I'm pretty sure we're probably going to need a follow-on podcast, but I just appreciate everything you shared here today and love that you came on, love that you shared these insights. I hope people took a lot of notes. So thanks for coming on, Sebastian. Really Thank you so much. It. Thank you for having me.